template for you. Don't worry. Uh, and we will, uh, we will certainly, or you will certainly be able to see the lecture uh, online. And uh, you can also contact me if you have a question. I will try to answer it uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I'll first try to, um, to share my screen so uh, that you can see uh, the PowerPoint. So there I go. And I hope it is fine. Just a minute. Oh, wait, yeah. Yes. Um, yes, it there should be fine yeah. now. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much. So uh, as I've announced in the uh, introduction, I would like to discuss with you about animals, animals in a Buddhist monastery. Of course, this is a very large scope and uh, I cannot treat every detail. But uh, if you have any questions, just ask and uh, we will see how far it will get us. Um, I will focus today on the Vinaya master Tao Shuen, because as you might know, I'm very interested in ideas that travel from India to China, and then especially in the way uh, they are interpreted in China, because it's never easy to translate, first of all, and to receive so many rules, so many details, so many new ideas from a completely different part of the world, and then to adapt them in your own monastery. So how did the Vinaya Master Tao Shuen think about that? Of course, the first sources he would refer to are the Vinaya sources. I think many of you already know about Vinaya, but I will still introduce them a little bit to you. So Vinaya sources are normative texts, texts full of rules. And today we have six extant Vinayas. One in the Pali language, the so-called Theravada Vinaya. And this is the standard Vinaya in Southeast Asia today. It has never been translated into Chinese, or at least maybe one translation or partially existed, but it's no longer extant. But there is a commentary, the Samantha Pasadika, that is translated into Chinese, or at least a version of which is translated to Chinese. And that will be quoted by Tao Xuan. I will return to that later in this lecture. Then we have four vinyas that have been translated in the fifth century. The Shu Songlu, the Sarvastivada vinya, the Sofnlu, the Dharmagupta Kavinya. And this is the Vinaya that in the 8th century became the standard Vinaya in China to be used for all ordinations. Even the emperor said so. And it is also said that after that, no other Vinayas were used for ordinations. Of course, that wouldn't happen from one day on the other, but it is clear that Dharmagupta Kavinya took over all ordination processes from around the 8th century on. Then we have the Mahasangika Vinaya also translated in the 5th century, as well as the Mahishasa Kavinya, equally translated in the 5th century. Now, Dao Xuan will quote all four uh, Vinayas, although he says that Harmagupta Kavinya is the one that should be taken as a standard Vinaya. So already in his time, he was a firm promoter of the Sifnlu. But he says one should also use all other Vinayas in order to get a, a more complete picture of what the Buddha had to say. Of course, he could not quote the Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya, because this Vinaya has been translated in the 8th century only by the master Yi Jing. Um, there's a full version in Tibetan. Actually, the Tibetan version is the most comprehensive one. But of the Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya, there is also a large part extant in Sanskrit. I will refer to it every now and then just for a comparison, but Dao Xuan obviously could not yet use the Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya. So the sources of Dao Xuan are first of all Vinayas, but then a lot of other texts too. I will refer to a few of them. And then he is one of the commentators in the eighth century that wrote on the Vinaya text. He's not the only one, but arguably the most important one. He also wrote new manuals for monastics. So how monastics should live in the Chinese monasteries of the Tang Dynasty, early Tang Dynasty. When discussing animals, one can, of course, also look into other sources. I'm just mentioning a few of them. The Bodhisattva rules, which I will not deal with today, but they can be very important uh, when discussing animals. If we have time in the q and I will certainly uh, go into that. There are also travel reports by I Ching, but also others who have traveled to India and have taken a lot of ideas with them and discussed them, also discussing animals. And you, of course, have also the rules of purity that became important in the uh, Song dynasty. 
rules of purity or lists of rules typically written for the large state monasteries of the Chinese state. So these are other sources that we could go into, but I will focus today on Dao Xuan and his commentaries. When discussing the Vinaya and the commentaries, one can always ask the question, what is their historical value? Does the text or do these texts have a historical value? Can we really learn what happened? What happened at the time? And we could also compare it to, to modern, to contemporary issues. For instance, I don't know in which room you are or in which place you are, but very often we find all kinds of signs around us. Um, for instance, on COVID, for instance, uh, do wear a mask at all times. Now, do people always wear a mask? Is this sign still there? although the mask is no longer uh, compulsory and so on. This was actually also the case, of course, when texts were written uh, in India in the different uh, regions of India. They were written with a name, but the aim itself is of course also very interesting. It tells us something about society. It tells us about the ideal setting of the authors or what the, the ideas that the authors and the compilers of the Vinayas had in mind. Here, by the way, I would like to stress that the vinyas are written in several different parts of India. And when they come to China, people like Tao Xuan consider them all as the word of the Buddha. So they don't take into account the different regions where the different vinyas have come into being. So I will not go into, the, into this today, but actually if one wants to learn about the situation in India using the vinyas, one should also keep uh, an eye on the region in which the vinyas have been written because India, of course, is a very large country, a very large region. So it's impossible to say that all rules are valid in all kinds of regions. But when the, the, the rules came to China, they were seen as one. Now, what is also important, I think, when discussing normative texts is that the objects and the practices in these texts are at least imaginable. For instance, if these texts speak about mosquito nets, to give you an idea, people who were reading or maybe listening, translating these texts, they must have had an idea of how a mosquito net looked like or how it could look like. So the objects are imaginable, that's one thing. And secondly, even more important, I would say, is that the text also reveal incidentals. Now, this is a term I've taken from Jan Matthew, and I would like to quote um, the first, I think it's the first time that she, um, that she refers to it, but it might be a uh, second or a third time. In any case, in 2005, in a work on the Bodhisattvas, she wrote, we may draw with some confidence on data found within a normative text when incidental mention is made of items unrelated to the author's primary agenda. And I really like this sentence and this idea. Incidental mention is made of items unrelated to the author's primary agenda. I think this is very inspirational. And to give you an example, because it might sound a bit abstract, to give you an example, um, I will refer to an example I often, I often use. It's an example on toilets. Uh, some years ago, together with uh, my colleague Matthew Tork, I wrote a, a book on bodily care and on everything which is inevitable, which inevitably is going to happen to your body. For instance, when you drink and eat, you inevitably are going to the toilet. Now, in the Mula Sarvastiva Adaminia, a vinaya that has been completed relatively late in uh, the development of the vinayas, there is a very interesting story on a Brahmin who wants to actually to be to belong to a group. He does not know yet which group, but to a religious group, which, according to him, is clean and pure, pure mind in a clean, in a clean body. And he is looking for different, uh, different possibilities. And one day he sees Shariputra. Now, Shariputra, as you know, is a very important um, um, very, sorry, very important pupil of the Buddha. And Shariputra starts to find, starts to know that uh, actually someone is following him, that the Brahmin is following him. So Shariputra goes to the toilet and leaves the door open. And then he, then it's described what he does in the toilet and how, uh, how carefully he washes himself after going to the toilet. 
Now, of course, I have abbreviated the story quite sharply, but the incidental in this story is the door. Now we know that a toilet has a door because he leaves the door open, and that's not obvious. So for the authors of this text, the door was just something they mentioned. It's not their primary agenda, but it shows us that the toilet has a door. And this is what Jan Nettier means by incidentals. And this kind of little remarks can teach us a lot about the material culture of the time of the Vineyards. And of course, as I always, as I already highlighted, the, um, the, the, the texts themselves, they highlight the normative values. And I think this is important in say for a Buddhist text to know what the normative ideal setting was. And finally, one can corroborate findings with a relevant context. One can look into archaeology. One can look for toilets, for instance. Um, one can look into non-Buddhist sources that describe similar events. One can look into murals. And you will find a lot of depictions of animals on, for instance, the Tuanhuang murals. I will show you um, maybe not the Tuanhuang mural today, but at least one picture to, to just show what I mean with non-Buddhist sources and with archaeology to corroborate the relevant context, even when dealing with animals. So this study or my study usually is very uh, much embedded in what we could call material culture. And here you have a definition by uh, John Kishnick in an Oxford uh, handbook on religion and emotion. And he says, material culture is generally defined as artifacts, so when discusses objects, and these objects can also be animals, let's say, as well as ideas about and conduct related to artifacts. So this is very important. It's not only the objects, it's not only the, the, the artifacts that we discuss, they can be animals maybe also, but especially also the ideas about and the conduct related to artifacts. For instance, the conduct related to a mosquito net, the conduct related to a fan, uh, to, to uh, chase away flies. And artifacts are then limited to material objects made or altered by human beings. So artifacts, like a mosquito net, they can create reaction and emotion. But a lot of uh, artifacts I'm dealing with actually are also there to avoid reaction and emotion. A mosquito net, for instance, avoids us to react. If we have a good mosquito net, we don't think too much about the mosquitoes. And we avoid emotions. We avoid emotions like, I actually should kill this mosquito because it will bite me and it will, it will annoy me. So objects are very often made to create a reaction or an emotion, but also very often to avoid a reaction or an emotion. So this brings me then to the non-killing and the release of animals and to the topic of the animals itself. As you all know, in Buddhist text, non-killing is very important. And non-killing involves indeed also the non-killing of animals. Animals that are not seen as objects, as I might have suggested a little bit, but animals that are seen as sentient beings that should not be killed. And they should also be released as far as possible. I will return to this question. As far as possible, because it's not always possible to release captured or domesticated animals. But against this background, a few questions can be asked. For instance, can one kill in self-defense? Imagine you're attacked by a tiger. Can one kill the tiger or, or not? Um, it can also be a snake or a scorpion. Can one capture or remove an animal? For instance, can one capture the snake or remove the snake or remove the scorpion from your house? Or should one protect, cherish, endure or ignore animals. Not always, not always easy. Huh? Imagine you have bad bugs and you try to ignore them. Is that a solution? So these questions are asked in the Vinaya, very practical questions actually. It's all against the background of non-killing. Killing of an animal cannot be done, but it is a lesser offense than killing a human being. This is in all Vinayas the same. This, the, the, the quotation you have here is a quotation from the Southern Buddha, from the Dharmagupta Kavinya. And it says, if a bhikshu, a monk, but it's the same for nuns, deliberately breaks off the life of an animal, he commits a pachitika. 
A pachitika offense, and there are variants, uh, variant Indic terms, a pachitika offense is an offense that needs to be confessed. Sometimes a punishment will follow. It's not a very severe offense, but it still is an offense. So one should not kill an animal. Of course, another very important term in this rule is the word deliberately. Intention is indeed a very important factor. Intentionally killing is something one should not do. But one should also be conscious that one's actions can harm or kill animals. What do I mean with it? Well, intention as we see today is maybe too narrow. If we have a good look at the Vinaya text, we see that a lack of care is also uh, seen as deliberate killing, as intentional killing in the Chinese word ku, so intention. For instance, you know there is a road and on this road, there are a lot of ants. So if you walk the road without paying attention to the ants, all by you know there are a lot of ants on the road, you actually are also consciously harming or killing animals. Insects in the water, for instance, is a very obvious example in many vinea rules. The vineyards contain extensive guidelines on how to use water strainers. There are a lot of small animals in the water, and if one drinks the water, and one does not care about animals that are in the water, one actually consciously kills the animals. So there are a lot of guidelines on how to use a water strainer. And if one does not have a water strainer, it might be really dangerous. The Mahishasaka, for instance, has an example of a monk who died of thirst. He was walking on a quite long journey and he didn't have a water strainer. And all by he really needed to drink he did not dare to do so because he was afraid that he might kill small insects in the water. And as a result, he dies of thirst. Of course, this is an extreme example, but it shows how important the water strain was and it will become a very important object of a monk. The Sarvastivana Vinya has a similar rule. And he said, when there it said, for instance, that um, you can walk, you can go on a journey without a water strainer if your companion has a water strainer, but only if you're sure that your companion is willing to share his water strainer with you. I like this little twist of the Vineyards when they say, okay, go without a water strainer if your friend has one, but be sure that your friend wants to share his water strainer, otherwise you are in trouble. Captured animals then. Okay, the animals are then captured in this water strainer. So what to do with them? Well, they should be released in a safe way. One cannot just take out the insects off the water and then think everything is settled. No, one has to put the animals then back in water or in um, moisty mud so that they can survive. In the Munasarvastivana um, Vinya, again, probably because it's closed at a later time, one sees that um, the monks or the authors of the of author, maybe one author, authors in plural, of the vinya start to also have some compassion for the animals. In the other vinyas, it is just said one should save the animals. But in the Munasaras Divada vinya, it is also said that the animals, insects, can become nervous. So the, 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 little, the little small and insects are getting nervous when you're taken out of the water. So the Vinya says one should put, put some must or moisty sand in the water strainer so that when one takes out the, uh, the insect, it doesn't feel anxious. And then of course one has to place it in a safe place. Now I Ching, who translates this uh, passage, adds something else. He adds a note that refers to karma. And he says that careless monks, so monks who do, who do not do so, might be reborn in hell as a hungry ghost or as an animal. And this is a typical later edition. You will not find this in the Vinya itself. This is in a note by the translator I Ching. Also Dao Xuan, and I will return to that later, will add karma to all these rules. But in the vineyard itself, you will not see any karmic 
references, or he references to karma when killing is involved. But one does see in the Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya that insects are given some kind of expression, some kind of emotion, namely they get very nervous. But then the question remains, of course, can one defend oneself against a wasp, for instance? or take measures against annoying animals, against the mosquitoes. I'm talking a lot of mosquitoes, maybe because it's summer and I have been bitten all over actually. So they are quite annoying animals. The Sarvastivada Vinya has an interesting question. The question says, if a bhikshu, a monk, kills an evil animal or a venomous snake and so on, he does not commit the pachitika or answer. So this is a quotation from the Vinya. He commits a pachitika. If he kills other good animals, he equally commits a pachitika. So the killing does not take into account whether the animal is an annoying animal or dangerous animal. Any killing is wrong. But what to do then? I will, of course, return to this question. But before doing so, let's have a look at the releasing of animals. What about releasing animals? We have discussed already the insects in the strainer. OK, that's clear. But do the Vinayas already discuss the release of animals? I think all of you know a lot about releasing animals. You all have seen pictures, I think, or maybe have done so yourself, of releasing turtles in a monastery, fishes, birds. You see it um, in East Asia, you see it in Southeast Asia, you see it actually everywhere. The Vinaya does not discuss that so much. You will not find in the Vinayas um, discussions on the, the, the collective release of fishes and turtles. That's a later edition. On the other hand, you do find discussions on release. It is not so that the Vinayas do not discuss release. For instance, um, they discuss the release of individual domesticated animals. But taking them from their owner is stealing. Still, the intention plays a role in establishing how bad the offense is. In the Dharmagupta Kavinya, for instance, you have a monk who passes by a farm and he sees that the dog is attached to the door and the dog is crying a little bit. So he has a compassionate mind and he goes to the farm and he releases the dog. As a result, he's actually stealing because it's, there's an owner of this dog. Um, but uh, Dan de Vinia says, because he had a compassionate mind, he is not punished for stealing. Stealing would actually mean exclusion from the monastic community. It's a parajika offense. So de Vinia says, well, he did not commit a parajika offense, but he should not have stolen the dog. Actually, he didn't really steal it, he released it, but it's compared to stealing. The same for a young pig that was equally attached in form. Um, when uh, the monk passes by and sees the, um, the young pig, he also uh, feels pity for the pig and releases it. And it's the same story. It's not a parajika offense, it's a pachitika offense because yeah, he, he actually felt some pity for um, the pig. Another thing are the captured animals, the captured animals by hunters. The Mahishasa Kavinia, for instance, has a very nice story on a hunter who chases a boar, a wild boar. And the wild boar is escaping, actually, and the monk sees it. Now, the hunter comes to the monk and asks the monk, where is the boar? Did you see my boar? And the monk says, a boar. Is there a boar? Have you seen a boar? I didn't see a boar. He's actually lying. And so the hunter cannot catch the boar anymore. Now, after that, the monk is a little bit afraid. He thinks, well, I have been lying, and lying is something I should not do. And then the Buddha said, well, but you saved a life. You have said other things to save a life. So it's no offense at all. No offense. So, okay. <laughs> um, but then uh, a little bit later, the same Vinaya discusses uh, a deer, a deer that has been taken by the hunter and is already attached. At that time, uh, at that point, the monks cannot help the deer anymore because now the deer has an owner, a rightful owner, and that's the hunter. Okay, we know now about domesticated animals and captured animals, but can one capture animals in self-defense or take other measures? For instance, one catches a snake 
and one puts it in a, a cage so that it doesn't harm anymore. Um, just in between, for those who might never have seen it, but I think you have, um, on the left, you see a picture of the blessing of animals. That's completely new. You will not find that in, uh, in the Vines. On the right, you see the release, I think, of crabs. Um, but I've also added uh, for your uh, information two interesting YouTube uh, small uh, movies. One is on the releasing of birds uh, in Cambodia. So you can have a look at it uh, later and, and maybe think about it, what, what's happening here. And then you have a, um, a longer discussion with um, Venerable uh, Shung Yen of the Dharma Drum um, Monastery in close to Taipei, uh, where he also discusses the release of animals in in the Chinese context. But this is, of course, a kind of contemporary uh, setting that you might all know. But I wanted to add it uh, for your information because many people discussing this kind of issues will rely then on the vineyards and on commentaries, especially also in China, the commentaries by Dao Xuan. So his ideas are not forgotten. Um, so you will see if you uh, click on the link uh, later on. So, Protecting them, how to protect oneself, first against dangerous animals and then against annoying animals. Do the vineyards then offer any solution? Now, the dangerous animals in the vineyards are the snakes, scorpions, centipedes, and venomous insects, not so much tigers, for instance. It might tell us something on the um, residential lifestyle of the monks when snakes, scorpions, centipedes, and venomous insects are the most dangerous animals that we find in the vineyards. Now, what to do? Well, careful behavior when entering buildings. When you open the door, you have a good look. When you use ropes or sleeping mats, you first shake them to be sure there are no scorpions inside. There are also a lot of instructions on where to build and hold meetings and on how to build, for instance, efficient drainage systems or well-protected doors and windows. By the way, this is also a very good way to learn about uh, how, to how to build uh, a monastery. Um, we can learn a lot on material culture by just reading all these texts. And there are a lot of measures also to take when confronted with dangerous animals. One can remove them, but without causing harm. For instance, a tube to contain the snake and a rope to tie it. But after that, one should release it. And then about annoying animals. Well, the annoying animals are especially the crows, insects, mosquitoes and flies, and venomous insects. Crows are even related to the ordination of a novice. They are described as um, very annoying animals because they take away the food, the food of the monks. And you have to be strong enough to chase them when you want to be ordained as an office. There's a lot more I could tell about this, but I will leave it here for now. And then maybe surprisingly, um, when monks are warned, uh, warned about the hardships of a monastic life, uh, insects is part of it. If you cannot stand mosquitoes and flies, you should not be ordained, you should not become a monk, and you will find this information in many vineyards. So what to do then? Well, you can avoid them. You can live in a place where there are no such animals, or at least in a limited number. You can remove them with a mosquito net, a fan, or a whisk without causing harm. And these fan and whisks um, need to be socially acceptable also especially the fan and the whisk. They should not be too rich. So the material used should be a very common uh, material, not to be not too rich material. And for women, and there are many women maybe among you, yeah, you should not uh, wave them too much like this because this might be sexually attractive, but that's another topic of the veneer I could go uh, into. Other animals that are very annoying, I have no time to go into it, but could be ants, bad bugs or dogs. Dogs can take away your shoes, for instance. Um, maybe one last information before we go then to the reaction of Tao Xuan to all this information. That is, um, if you really cannot uh, take them away or remove them, maybe you should leave the place and build your monastery in another place instead of killing the insect or the snakes uh, in your monastery. 
So this is a small picture of uh, maybe too beautiful risk. So the conclusion for the winner, what to do with dangerous, annoying animals against the background of non-killing and release? Well, one should avoid them and if confronted with them, remove them. One should cause no harm, one should carefully release them if possible. A better is doesn't mean that we have a better life for snakes and mosquitoes compared to the domesticated or hunted animals. Yeah, maybe, maybe so. And this is something that Daoshuan will discuss. But of course, this is also related to social conventions, to ownership. So can you change that? Well, Daoshuan is going to discuss all this information. And uh, especially in his main commentary, the abridged and explanatory commentary on Dharmagupta Kavinia. He speaks a lot about protecting the animals, including the insects. I will give you some quotations. For instance, this one. As mentioned, Daoshan says, in the Ming Liao Wen. The, the Ming Liao Wen is a commentary on the Vinaya of the Samitia school. The Vinaya of the Samitia school is lost, it's no longer extant. But the commentary on it is and has been translated into uh, Chinese. In, I have a quick look, I think, in the sixth, uh, no, in the, yeah, in the sixth century, sorry. <laughs> so he says, when he's discussing, and when he is discussing killing, as mentioned in the Mingyal one, there are four kinds of despicable acts that are recorded as offenses. One, being greedy, angry or foolish with a contaminated mind. Two, showing disbelief in the working of karma. And here I have highlighted karma, and you see that Tarshwan will immediately introduce the concept of karma when discussing killing. Three, not cherishing the precepts one has accepted, of course, the Vinayas. And four, belittling the words of the Buddha. If one acts intentionally, and again, also for Tarshwan, intention is a very broad concept, one experiences heavy karmic effects. As this text explains, since there is no shame when acting deliberately, there is no shame and not even beginning of repentance. This is a non-benevolent state of mind. Therefore, the Chengshu Wen says, and the Chengshu Wen is a philosophical text um, that has been translated also by Kumarajiva in the fifth century. And this is a very interesting quotation. Um, Dao Xuan will quote the Chong Shul Wen twice, um, only twice in, well, no, we'll, we'll use this quotation, he might quote it more often, but he quotes this particular sentence only twice in his commentary, because it's quite heavy, um, quite, yeah, I could say heavy. Uh, well, let's first have a look. Therefore, the Chong Shul Wen says that killing an ant with an evil state of mind is worse than killing a person with a compassionate state of mind. So here, killing an ant is worse than killing a person, at least when the killing of an ant has been done with an evil state of mind, then it's worse than killing a person with a compassionate state of mind. Since the basic karmic effect will be heavy, one certainly receives retribution, even if one expiates the pachitika offense, the karma will not be annulled. One can expiate the pachitika offense with the confession, as I've said before, but it will never annul the, um, the karmic effect, which is very heavy. And this is, of course, a strong statement that killing an ant is worse than killing a person with a compassionate state of mind. And he repeats it once more in, an, uh, in another uh, sentence when he again discusses uh, the non-killing. As for the third parajika rule on killing, parajika rule is a rule that will exclude you forever, out of your status of a monk or, mon or nun. As for the third parajika rule killing, it is as the Chongshul Wen says, and the Chongshul Wen refers to, as said in the Shat, in the Shat Pad Abhidharma text. These are seven texts, that uh, seven Abhidharma texts that have been taken as a whole. Um, therefore, it said the Shat Pad Abhidharma text, six feet and one body. Uh, shat is a six feet and then there is one body above it, but that's another discussion. Important is this, killing a bad person is a lighter offense than killing an insect or an ant. The reason is that such a person is polluting the world and causing a lot of damage. Now, this is an even stronger statement. Um, this is, of course, uh, linked to the discussions on violence and compassionate killing 
um, how far can being with enlightened or close to enlightenment even kill to save other beings? That's of course another discussion and would be uh, certainly the topic of another uh, lecture, um, violence uh, or the condonance of violence in uh, Buddhism. What is important here is that killing the insect or an ant is really seen as something very bad, even worse than killing a bad person. So not surprisingly, Tao Xuan will then uh, incite monastics to do everything they can not to kill. And so also not to engage in digging, agriculture and forestry. Obviously, as many of you will know, he has not been followed by uh, his companions because um, agriculture became even quite important in um, a Buddhist uh, monastic setting. But according to, to Tao Xuan, one shouldn't do so. And he refers, for instance, to uh, this uh, rule of the Dharmagupta Kavinya. If a bhikshu personally digs the ground or tells someone else to dig the ground, he commits a pachitika offense because potentially one kills insects. Of course, one should also not use silk. As you know, when using silk, one has killed a lot of animals. Um, and this is not from his main commentary. This is from a text he wrote on um, monastic clothing. And he says, nonetheless, nothing is a worse transgression than to make clothes out of silk. This is why in the sutras, the process of breeding and subsequently killing silkworms is called an evil act. Compared with the number of creatures killed by butchers and hunters, it's a million times worse because you just kill many more uh, silkworms to, to make a rope. Um, of course, again, he has not been followed by many of his companions. Um, and if you want to read more about silk and silkworms and the normative texts about silkworms, I can certainly recommend you the work by Stuart Young, who has written a lot on silk and silkworms killing uh, in, Buddhist, in Buddhism in China. Um, so, okay, you cannot use silk, but when we then go to his main commentary, and we look at his discussion on water strainers, so Dao Xuan's discussion on water strainers and Dao Xuan's discussion on mosquito nets, you will find that he says that a water strainer can be made out of silk and that the mosquito net can be made out of silk. This is, of course, uh, quite ironic because silk is killing a lot of insects and then you would use silk to use a water strainer or to make a mosquito net. Now, probably this is a kind of incidental. That means that when Daoshan was discussing the water strainer, or was discussing the mosquito net, he was focusing on how to save the animals and didn't really think about silk or how silk was made. So he just added it without paying attention that, yeah, silk was indeed also made by uh, killing animals. So you see that even Daoshuan is not always um, straightforward. But anyhow, when he discusses silk himself, he says one should not do so because one kills a million of uh, silkworms. He is not followed. Um, and one of those who did not follow him is, for instance, Yi Jing, who reacts quite strongly. And in his account of Buddhism sent from the South Sea, so his travel account, Yi Jing says, as regard to use of fine and tough silk, it is permitted by the noble ones. Why should one forcibly prohibit the use of it? Why would we reject silk, which is easy to procure, and try to obtain fine cotton, which is difficult to find? Isn't it the hindrance that obstruct the way to the utmost? Such a rule belongs to the class of prohibitions that were not laid down by the Buddha, but were enforced by others, and others are people like Daoshan. They caused some meddlesome observers of the Vinyan rules to swell their self-conceit and look down upon others. Now, silk is, of course, also an identity marker of Chineseness, even Tang Dynasty. So it will be very difficult to convince uh, people not to use silk. And I Ching uh, is actually in favor of using silk. Another product that Dao Xuan discusses all by shortly is honey. Honey is used as a medicine in the Vinaya. And it was widely used in Tang China, 
However, um, there are other sweeteners such as maltose and sugar. But Darshwan says one should not take honey when there are still bees around. And he refers for that to the Sangika Vinaya, where the Buddha accepts such things as ripe honey offered by monkeys, but they took it from a place where there are no bees. And this is important for Darshwan. Still, he himself also acknowledges that it is not always easy to avoid any harm. Again, in his uh, text on uh, robes, he writes this. The text of preserving life is really difficult, not to mention the casualties when setting the wood on the hills on fire for land clearance, when draining water and irrigating fields, and when ploughing the soil. One also cruelly injures living beings to a great extent when caging calves and milking cows. That's also an interesting topic. One day I would like to write an article on that and when plundering bees and stealing their honey. Have we ever spared the thought for the vegetables that insects and reptiles rely upon, or the food that flies and popeye depend on? The living beings in firewood and water are innumerable. The living beings that reside in grass and soil are as numerous as the people who gather in the village. But if we look at what passes through our bodies and mouths, this is really difficult not to cause any harm. So obviously he understands that, yeah, not to cause any harm is really difficult. So on the annoying insects, well, he will, and we have first discussed the useful insects maybe, but on the annoying insects, it's maybe easier. No killing, safe removal, a mosquito net can be used, but he does not give a lot of details. And that's maybe not a surprise. Because if we read into um, other texts, non-Buddhist texts, and I can recommend you the work of Olivia Milborn, who has written on uh, insects and more particularly mosquitoes in tongue literature. And she has found that the mosquito net was actually quite expensive and was only old, owned by rich people. And monastics probably did not have a lot of mosquito nets. We can also see that uh, when Enin uh, arrives in uh, China, Enin is a Japanese monk who in the ninth century arrives in China. And the first thing he says when he arrives in China, at least according to his diary, is that there were so many mosquitoes and that he and his companions could not sleep because of the mosquitoes. So obviously they did not have um, mosquito nets. And of course, he also says that one should be very careful not to kill any animals when walking. And that's, for instance, in the new manual he wrote uh, for novices in training. Another um, text that I will finish with today um, is a text uh, on all kinds of objects. And therefore I said that maybe uh, animals are sometimes treated as objects, but that's, that's, uh, that's very um, dangerous to say so. I don't think Tauschwen uh, saw uh, animals as objects. He saw them as sentient beings, but he puts them in the property, in the property that monastics can have. And he has written a very interesting text um, on models for measuring and handling light and heavy property. This is not a translation. This is not so much a discussion on Vinaya rules. This is really his own thoughts uh, on how to handle property in a, a monastery. It's a very dense text, very difficult to translate. Um, but maybe one day uh, there will be a full translation of this text. Now, the light and heavy property that he discusses is distinguished as follows. Light goods are distributed to the order that is present, which is probably a reference to members of the Sangha who are present at a particular time and in a particular place. So the, the actual monastery. Well, heavy goods belong to the order of the four quarters and are seen as communal property of the whole uh, Sangha. Now he will discuss uh, animals and you will see that I start immediately with four. So in one of his sections, if I'm not wrong, it's the ninth section, he discusses animals, but it starts with four because he does not, he puts the animals in a little bit strange section. Um, in the section of slaves, or strange, yeah, maybe this is our reputation, but in the strict section of slaves and servants. 
So one, two, and three, which I did, I did not discuss here, are actually ideas he has about slaves and servants in a monastery. Also a very interesting topic to delve into. And then four is the first kind of animal. You also have five and six. Four, one keeps domesticated animals, such as camels, horses, donkeys, cattle, and sheep. One also has items such as saddles and saddle clothes, bridles and reins, fence pants and staples. I will not go too deep into this category, but I can tell you that um, if one treats the animals well, Daoshuan will acknowledge that one can keep them and one can certainly use them um, for, especially the horses and the donkeys, for transport. So this is not such a difficult question for him, although one should treat the animals very well. So um, that's important to him. Then the fifth uh, section is, of course, for him, a difficult section, but the solution is relatively easy. One just should release these animals. But he says that one keeps wild animals in the monastery, such as, uh, also, such as people do also, huh? just as people do. Um, one keeps wild animals such as apes and monkeys, river deer and deer, bears and brown bears, pheasant, rabbits, mountain cocks, wild dogs, geese and wild geese. And one also keeps items such as cages and racks. Of course, again, it's difficult to know what exactly happens, but at least he imagines that these animals are sometimes kept in an animal, in a, in, sorry, in a monastery, excuse me. So we should release them. But it's not always possible. For instance, he says, wild ducks sometimes have their wings clipped. And people did that also today to avoid these ducks from flying away. So ducks, geese, they sometimes have their wings clipped. And if this is the case, he says, one cannot release these animals because they cannot fly. They would just die. So what is the solution? Well, one should give them food. One should give them drinks. One should just take care of them. It would be interesting. Um, and maybe one day if I have time it, or you have time. Uh, to see whether uh, this was actually happening. But it's his idea. And one category I would like to discuss a little bit is the sixth category. This is the animals that he sees as a sign of evil deportment. And these animals are cats, dogs, owls, and how. And why? Because they are just like poison and crossbows. They can be used to kill rats. And of course, there are also cages and so on. And just as bows and arrows and five kinds of weapons, traps and snares, all instruments to kill, the monastery should not have them. And this I will discuss a little bit more and to, to give you a translation of what he says about that and to give you an idea of how his text is composed. As for the sixth subsection, he says, things connected to evil deportment. So there are evil deportment. At first, he discusses weapons. There are not so many in this category. So remember, he's actually discussing animals, but he changes them to kind of objects used to kill. And he says, at times, a lack of knowledge is evident in remote as well as central regions. Some People keep and use such things. Yet, since these things exa exacerbate, it's a difficult word, the offense of not protecting living beings, they should be burned and rejected. Obviously, this is not discussing the animals. This must be weapons. Using them is just as much against the Dharma as a hut made out of mud, which must be destroyed. Um, there are two vinyas, the Dharma Gupta Kavinya and the Mahishasaka Vinya, if I'm not wrong that say that uh, one cannot build a hut made out of mud because one kills a lot of insects when building such a mud. And these huts must be destroyed. Actually, the owner, who is a monk, is, um, is actually protesting and says, no, 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 against the Buddha, actually not. But then he says, well, because the Buddha said it, I will still destroy my hut. Therefore, Dao Xuan continues, the Shanjian Lu Pi Pusha, and this is the Samantha Pasadika, the uh, translation 
uh, of which in, it's called Sanja Lu Pi Po Sha in Chinese, but it's not a translation of the Pali version we have, but a version which is similar. So the Shangja New People Sha says that if one is offered weapons, the Shangha should destroy them and one cannot sell them. If one sells a weapon to a person before they commit a murder, then the seller's karmic retribution is the same as the murderer's. This is also very important. If one sells a weapon to someone, one actually, and, and, and the weapon is used to kill, actually the seller is also killing. And this is the same if one sells a cat or a dog to someone and then the dog or the cat is used to kill. In the commentary, and maybe this is the Shanjalu people shy, it's not sure. In the commentary, it is said that if one keeps things that go against the rules, then the monastic manager should destroy them so neither wealth nor fault increases. There is something like this in Samantha Pasadika, so maybe this is Tao Xuan's interpretation of it. The correct position it is these things are clearly prescribed. This is doubtless the standard to follow. I put the correct position in green because I'm not sure about the translation. The um, Chinese text says Zheng Wan. Now Zheng Wan could be a reference to a text, but I could not find any text that corresponds uh, to this quotation. So I just translated it as the correct position. But if any of you has a better idea, please just uh, write an email to me and I will be happy to acknowledge you. I, sometimes Darshwan can be very difficult to understand. And then he goes on to the cats and dogs and says, there are also those who breed and keep cats and dogs specifically to kill rats. Indeed, dogs are used to kill rats in China. The cat took over in the Tang Dynasty only. The sutras and commentaries generally prescribe this as evil department. And, and this, this evil department, you will be able to find in a lot of sutras and commentaries discussing animals. By keeping these animals for pest control, one diverges from the good precepts. If one sells them, remember selling the weapons, the karmic retribution will be even worse since they are living beings. If one gives them to someone else, this still perpetuates harmful intentions and ultimately results in karmic bondage. It is fitting to release them in the wilderness and allow them to come and hide as they wish. So if the cat and the dog come, you have to feed them. The manifest yoke of forced bondage increases their hardship. Only by following the previous determination can we both, animals and monastics, feel at ease and thus calm the enemy of birth and death and newly establish a holy residence of compassion. As for birds of prey, they should be dealt with according to the same principle and released into the air. So uh, for those who might doubt that dogs can take rats, uh, this is uh, something to corroborate our findings. This is a picture from a tomb in a Sichuan area um, of the Han Dynasty. And you see that in the tomb, there is a dog and he catches a rat. So to come to my conclusion on Dao Shen, um, well, remember he says himself that all living beings are equally endowed with the potential to Buddha out. This is why we should not kill. This is to respect the teaching, to put trust in the law of cause and effect and so secure a long life. This is a basic idea of Dao Shen. Even if sometimes he discusses the compassionate killing, he returns uh, more often to this idea, which is uh, uh, quite uh, often mentioned also in the Yogacara um, school um, that he probably uh, was very aware of. In his uh, discussion on the Vinaya, he will stress intention more than the Vinaya itself, and then the karmic effect of killing or harming animals will also be very much underlined. Animals, including insects, need to be protected. So no harm, also no farming, actually. Some animals are indeed used, even in the monastery, but there is discussion on silk and bees, animals used for traveling, and certainly, as we have seen, cats and dogs. Animals should be released as much as possible it's not always possible, but as much as possible, it should be done. 
how to treat an animal that cannot be released, that remains for me an open question. So if you have ideas on it, it would be very, it would be great to hear about it. Did he change social conventions? Probably not that much, but at least he tried so, would be my answer here. So thank you very much. And the uh, picture you have here is one to avoid emotions when you are meditating. You have a nice mosquito net and the mosquitoes will stay away from you. So this is how uh, people today actually also try to meditate in countries or regions where there are a lot of mosquitoes. You can just find them everywhere, uh, on Amazon even, <laughs> if you want to have a look. So thank you very much. Uh, and I hope you have uh, questions or comments. I'll stop sharing so I see you a bit better. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Herman. That was uh, fascinating. Yeah, we'll open it up now. You're welcome to raise your hand or just unmute okay. yourself. So are you able to see the hands, the digital hands, Professor Herman? I don't see any hands for now. Okay, I see Valeria has her hand up. Okay, no, I don't see it, sorry. Okay. Oh. Thank you, Professor. It was a fascinating, very interesting lecture. <laughs> so uh, animals, it, it is cool. Uh, so I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, um, is it uh, if an animal is mortally wounded and suffering, uh, can it be killed? Uh, yeah, after all, uh, this will be uh, an act of compassion uh, for monk. Uh, is it right or not? It's the first question, yeah. Yes, um, well, I would say that uh, when I discuss animals, um, very often I get this kind of questions. And uh, I have to answer, I don't know. <laughs> because this is not discussed in the Vinaya. So they don't discuss uh, wounded animals and what to do with it. Um, now, generally, killing is not allowed. So I suppose it just has to die a natural death. And one cannot kill out of compassion. Um, of course, one, can, one cannot send an email anymore to Daoshuan and ask him about it. <laughs> but uh, in the Vineyas and in Daoshuan, this is not discussed. But the only compassionate killing that he discusses is this uh, violent killing, we could say, or, or the discussion on violence, um, namely, well, it's not violent, it's compassionate killing of a violent, potentially violent person. And he only refers to it twice, and he calls this compassionate killing because it's a bad person who will do a lot of harm. But then he does not extend this to, um, to animals, um, because animals are innocent. Um, and so I don't think there is compassionate killing for a wounded animal, I'm sorry. But even if you would do it, but maybe if you would do it today, you could discuss it. There's a lot uh, one can discuss with contemporary uh, monastics, I think. But it's not in the Vinaya, nor is it in Dao Shred's text. I see okay, the hands now, they start to come up, yeah. And the second one. <laughs> Um, as you uh, mentioned in conclusion, uh, everyone is uh, worthy of Buddhahood. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, equally, uh, is it a person or animal or insect? Uh, is it right? Yes. Mm. So, um, uh, in the lecture, it was mentioned that um, um, people shouldn't uh, sell um, bad things, bad objects, uh, such yes. as weapon and uh, evil animals. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, everyone uh, has, to uh, has the right to decide whether uh, it will be sinful or um, good. Uh, um, so we uh, um, deprive uh, this uh, bad animal uh, from their choice. We, uh, um, how to say? <laughs> um, so uh, it is. Uh, they are not equal. We. Uh, am I right? Yes. Well, they are not equal. Um, but there are no evil animals in that sense. That's only the Sarvastivada Vinya who asks this question and then says, no, one should not make a difference between evil and good animals. Animals are dangerous or annoying, but they are not seen as evil. So um, if the cat or the dog 
uh, kills another animal, um, it's only an evil act if this is um, ordered by the monastics to do so. So if uh, a monastic person has a dog with the purpose of killing the rats or a cat with the purpose of killing the rats, then it becomes evil deportment. But the evil deportment is always referring to um, the owner of the cat and the dog and actually not to the cat and the dog itself although they obviously kill each other, animals kill each other, but it's not discussed as evil. So in that sense, they are not equal. Um, human beings have the potential uh, to distinguish between an evil and a good act. And in that sense, a cat and a dog cannot do so. So in that sense, they are not equal. Human beings can make that difference. So in that sense, uh, <laughs> the, the animal remains innocent in a way, because it's not a, the animal cannot make a difference between the good and the evil act. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, I saw a hand by Laura. Yes, thank you very much, Professor. Thanks to your lecture, I can uh, trace back um, the origin of a uh, lot of uh, ideas from uh, 10th century, century later from uh, the morality books. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I found it very interesting, uh, particularly about what you said about the ants and uh, the lives of uh, ants being um, more important than um, a criminal um, a criminal um, lives, for example. For example, in um, I think we, we find the same idea in uh, the ledgers of merit and demerits from uh, Juron, when it says that uh, when you uh, save a person's life, you can uh, gain uh, 50 merits. But uh, when you save one insect life, then you can gain one merit. But then when you save a whole colony of um, uh, ants, then it means that you save uh, well, 10,000 may be uh, lives, so you, you it, in that sense, uh, um, hen's lives seems more important than a man's life. So kind of a bit uh, con contradictory, um, I think. And also I found very interesting um, the, this question about uh, int intention and doing things uh, Delibitary, um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, on purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, I have um, also um, I have uh, anecdotes about um, in morality books about um, a, a small boy who uh, eats uh, on purpose uh, a tiger, but he does it to save his father. So normally, that act of eating the father would be uh, eating the tiger would be a as a sinful act, but because he did it for a filial piety, then is uh, it's a good act. So intention is is everything, uh, I guess, in those type of uh, of text. And that's it. Thank you. I didn't have a question. Just I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your comments. Yes, indeed. When when does refer very often to the Tang Dynasty and and takes inspiration of it. Now, of course, um, Dao Xuan. I mean, I've taken this, this, these two quotations from his text. He, his text is very, very long. So it's not his main idea. Uh, what I wanted to show is that it is there. And it's not that uh, he does not uh, speak about violence. We, we, we would call it violence or compassionate killing. It's not that Darshan doesn't have it, but it's not overall in his text. But of course, um, I think it, it, it becomes even more important uh, later. Uh, that's one thing. Also, some yeah, and then of course yeah, there, it's sometimes also contradictory indeed because um, there are also uh, quotations. Now I should I should I don't know exactly where anymore now, but um, in the Vinayas, for instance, and also Dalshan referred to it. Um, when you kill a big animal, the karmic effect can be also very important because you need to do a lot of effort to kill it. For instance, an elephant, when killing an elephant, it, it demands a lot more effort than to kill an ant. So um, <laughs> sometimes it's counted that the elephant then counts for many, many other uh, animals because of the effort that you need to have to kill this big animal. So it's not always just 
1111, it's also the effort that uh, can play a role uh, in the killing. But this is just a small remark on what you said. Yeah. But it's interesting, yeah. So, absolutely. Thank you for the remarks. I don't know if there are any other questions or remarks or ideas, suggestions, corrections. Everything is possible. I see Sen uh, yeah, thank you, Professor. Um, I really enjoy the, the whole um, lecture. And um, I have a question concerning um, the materials that um, Dao Xuan draws upon in his in his commentary. So he seems to draw upon um, multi kinds of um, texts, um, not only from Vinayas, but also from um, something like Chen Shilun, so um, sort of like an epidemic um, literature. Um, I, I was wondering um, what did, did he see them like equally when they are issuing um, vinyas? And also, um, and I think in the opening part of the of the lecture, you mentioned that he um, he strongly proposed that the the, the best or the, the the best vinya that he thinks is one of the is it Gupta Guptaka vinya? So I, Lui, yeah, Gupta vinya. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, how does he show that he preferred that over the others? Did he use some kind of metaphors or rhetorics in his um, explanation and um, yeah that's my question thank you thank you very much no it's a very good question um well he just says it that for him the Sufan Lu is the most important one um his main reason seems to be that he thinks it's the first one the first vinya that was used for ordinations uh, in china he also has a very famous or by short passage on um, the fact that the Dharma Gupta Kavinya, according to him, is Mahayana, uh, is Tarong. <laughs> so it has Mahayana ideas. And then he tries to, to convince his public. It's a relatively short passage. It's very often quoted. It's very much known because it's, of course, very popular uh, in Chinese monastic texts uh, later on. But uh, he, I don't think he, he convinced himself so much about it then later because it's so short, he doesn't return to it. Um, but it's, of course, a passage that's very well known. But he says it's the first one, and therefore um, one should really stick to it. Um, and, uh, but then if you see, well, an idea I think I have a bit about Dao Shuen is that he really has his own opinions. He makes his own opinions by looking into his huge library. He had a very large library and also probably a very good memory because he seems to know where to find the, the text and the quotations. Um, but he composes his uh, idea. So he probably has an idea, but then tries to corroborate it by taking quotations, sometimes even out of context and putting them all together, no matter from which text they come to have his idea on how it should be. Um, but he also says that the Vinaya texts are normatively the most important ones. Uh, in, in, in his life, famously, he was first um, um, more keen on meditation. And then he found out, he says, that uh, without the Vinaya, there can be no meditation, which makes me think also a bit of Eric Green's uh, new book on Chan, um, on early Chan. I don't know if you have already read it, and uh, Professor Green will be uh, in the second uh, part, I think, of this intensive program and discussing this book. And he also actually also says that um, meditation will not be successful if uh, the rules and then the repentance of offenses made against the rules are not first acknowledged. And maybe, I mean, I just make this connection a little bit, but also Daoshwin at a certain point says, Vinaya is important, um, not only for uh, personal life, but also for the survival of the uh, monastic community. And again, he says that um, the most important Vinaya is the Sufundi. But he uses, immediately also says, one should also look into all other Vinayas because it's all the word of the Buddha. And they, that should inspire us that Dharma Gupta Kavinya doesn't have it all. But for the ordination line and so on, it should certainly be the Sufundi. I don't know if this answers your question. But, um... Yeah, it's certainly very interesting. And also the, the style of Dao Xuan's writing also remind me of the text I'm looking upon. So the Da Shen Qixing Lun, also in the same period of time, there seems to be a kind of 
um, tendency to um, gather all those informations from the Buddha, really, and try to work out a system by their own. Absolutely, yes, 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 yes. Because it's really, very yeah, of course, in, in 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 the early Tang Dynasty, all this information comes, and one needs to make it into a system. Certainly, this is also what Tao Shuen tries to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I saw something in the chat. Um, the book about uh, the silk. Yeah, it's a, I don't have the, the immediate title in my head, but it's the work by Stuart Young. Um, I will write his name. Professor Young has written more than one article and also a book on, on silk. So if you want to, uh, to find references or to read on silk and silkworms, uh, certainly can recommend his work. The exact title I will have to check now. I hope this is helpful. Any more? Are you getting tired? <laughs> Which I would fully understand <laughs> after so many days and long days of, uh, of this program. Mm -hmm. Did you have any questions for the students, Professor Human? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I I always like uh, uh, people discussing animals and uh, finding references to Tao Shuan because basically, I'm um, I'm always stopping at the end of the Tang Dynasty because there's so much material, but I'm always interested in to see what happens afterwards and how people would refer uh, to Tao Shuan's commentaries and ideas. So. Um, if you have anything to say about that, certainly uh, you can do so now or later or send me an email on that. I'm very interested in, uh, in the aftermath of Tao Shuan's ideas. Well, just, <laughs> I, I'll, I uh, work on, on Feng Shang and liberating lives uh, during the Qing period and the Republican period. And um, well, authors, well, copy his ideas, I guess, but they do not mention him. So you do not know that, it, that maybe he was the first one to write about it or, mm -hmm. uh, or that it is coming from Buddhist um, Vanayas or, or even Buddhist sutras sometimes. So his ideas became, well, not mainstream, but um, very widespread, at least in the moral, um, in the moral literature and uh, all these so yeah so i don't know if you can say that it is his legacy because uh, he is not mentioned but surely he made an impact and well authors uh, during the centuries wrote about it wrote about it and then maybe they know who it is from and so they don't mention it because no, maybe they sure. think that already uh, people already know about him being the original author, but uh, yeah. He's not alone, of course. I have taken him out now, uh, he's certainly not alone. So uh, toward the ideas that spread around, but he was very systematic. So that's why uh, it's so attractive to, to look into his uh, text. So thank you very much. Thank you very <laughs> much. <Maybe. laughs> Yeah, I think we, we can wrap up here if no one has any further questions or comments. Um, we have another day of sessions again tomorrow uh, with Professor Stone. So we'll sign off. Have a lovely evening, Professor Hierman. And Thank the rest you. of you, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye to everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Vicky. That was uh, wonderfully organized. <laughs> oh, that was, I, I really enjoyed that lecture. It's so fun to hear about it, you know.